Yeah, I'm Damien Cook. Um, this is this is Laura here. Laura was actually supposed to be giving this talk, but unfortunately she heard it back and couldn't fly up, so I'm filling in. So um, uh, just start to start by um, acknowledging the country of the Yarraga people uh, and any uh, elders who might be present, or, and um, also acknowledge the elders of the Barappa Barappa and any elders or people who might be in the room. Um, so this is a project um, in uh, in Victoria. And um, you can see there's a whole lot of dead trees here, and I'll explain how those trees died and, and what the project was all about. But I'd like to start off sort of on a global uh, scale and basically just remind everyone that loss and degradation of wetlands is a global issue. And um, in the last 100 years, we've lost somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the world's wetlands. And in some parts of Australia and other parts of the world, it's actually over 90 percent of the wetlands we've lost. So, so restoring wetlands is a pretty key thing. My study area is, is this area of northern Victoria. You've got the Murray River going through here. This is the Gumbau Forest, a large area of fairly intact floodplain forest. And you've got this amazing cluster of wetlands here. You've got the Lodden River comes down here, and the Evoca River here. So it's the meeting of these rivers that creates the, the, the conditions for all these um, fantastic wetlands. And you've got two Ramsar sites, so sites of international significance for, for waterbirds. That's the um, Gumbau Forest, which has lots of nesting colonies. And the three, 23 wetland complex here of the Green Ramsar wetlands. And this is a map of condition. So you can see the Gumbau Forest here is green. Green is good, and red is bad. Um, you can see there's a whole string of wetlands through here, um, which the hydrology has been just disrupted by an irrigation scheme. And so these wetlands here are now permanently flooded, which is basically stuffed them up in terms of vegetation and birds. Um, they're not much less productive. Um, some of the, the wetlands I'm talking about are these are the Grangey Marshes here. Um, even though they're not part of the irrigation scheme, they're still in poor condition. And in that area, we've got about 13,000 hectares where we've got dead tree canopies. So, um, and those are in wetlands that are either permanently flooded, so the river red gums, uh, and the eucalyptus commodulensis, and acacia stenophylla, or the euthymol, as the locals call it, um, can stand in water for about two or three years. Um, but if you, if you build a weir or you push water, irrigation water through, through the wetland, um, after about um, you know, four or five years, they, they, they die, they, they, they need oxygen down around the root systems. And so we've got, uh, yeah, this huge problem of all these dead trees. So this is our project area with the, the Karangi Marshes. Um, a really important part of the, the Karang Ramsar wetland site. Um, really creatively named, like Bale Bale's actually an indigenous name, so they got that one right, that was good. But then after that, they got really creative. And um, <laughs> it's like Bale Bale overflows. So the Evoca River comes in here, flows into Bale Bale. And then that overflows into first marsh and second marsh and third marsh. Really, got, yeah, really creative, doesn't it? Um, the, the duck shooters built a weir here because um, they wanted to hunt ducks in duck season, which is in autumn. That means you've got a whole water in the wetlands over summer. And so they, they wanted to deepen the wetlands, um, and that was an absolute disaster because that weir held the water back in, it increased the hydro period at the time that the wetlands were flooded. At the same time, you've got the lunettes along here, um, of the, all of the spin material that's been blown out of the wetlands. That's really, they're really fertile, and there's a lot of irrigation happening here. So you have this double whammy of um, increased waterlogging, but also um, salinity. The rapid rising groundwater coming up, and that's why all those trees in that first slide were dead. Um, the Evoca River is a really interesting river. It's, it's about the fifth, fifth largest catchment in Victoria. It's about 270 kilometres long, the whole catchment, and it all ends up down here in the Evoca marshes. It's actually an endorheic river, which means that um, Mostly it doesn't actually flow over the ocean, it mostly just gets flows into these marshes and evaporates out. And that does interesting things to the water chemistry, it's, um, it can get quite brackish because obviously the salt's accumulating, but in, importantly every now and then it does get a flush, so we get a really big flood, like 2011 we had this massive flood down the system, flush all the salts out. So it can handle a bit of brackishness, but it does, obviously doesn't like getting too salty. And, uh, and this is a pretty dry catchment, so um, the, the floods coming down the Evoca only happen about once every seven years. So here's the condition in, 2000, uh, sorry, in uh, 1945, some of the first aerial photography flown in Victoria. Um, you can see this beautiful healthy canopy of trees right through the wetland. Even this deepest area here of Third Marsh had scattering of these big old red gums. And they were, genetically, they were the ones that could survive from flooding for the longest. And, um, and but you can see by 2015, um, the effects of that weir and that salinity, the rising water table, had killed all these trees in Third Marsh. So basically, not a living tree up within that whole area. Some live trees fringing, so if, if the, some of the trees were on slightly higher ground, obviously didn't drown so much and they weren't as badly affected by that drought, rising uh, saline groundwater. Um, so that's what it would look like in its healthy state, that's our reference condition, and that's what it looks like now. 
Um, still being used, like lots of habitat there, lots of things for birds to nest on, and there's seagulls nests there, lots of holidays and things. Great, still great for reptiles, but um, but not as good as habitat as it, as it should be. Um, now for the Barapa Barapa people, um, this is a really uh, important area, and um, both sort of spiritually but then culturally as well. Like, um, so throughout these marshes, there's 350 registered sites, um, and there's heaps more that actually haven't been registered. So heaps of like. Yeah, there's lots of scar trees, scar black box and, and, and deep rooted wetlands, red gums, scar red gums, heaps of tools, and um, there's Uncle, Uncle Dixie showing the young fellows when we were out planting um, how cool, cool and was removed. And Dixie's actually one of these fantastic guys who is uh, re scarring trees. So rather than you know, scar trees being a thing of the past, he's actually going around um, culturally scarring trees to, to keep that culture alive. Um, the other thing, uh, the other main sites here are these oven mounds. Um, so you can see this is a this little island <coughs> that's sticking up above the level of the, the wetland. It's characterised by these burnt clay balls. So these are, there's no stone in this country, so when people wanted to make a, a ground oven, they actually pressed clay into these little balls, baked them, in, baked them in the oven, baked them in the fire, and made these heat beads. And then you can cook your fish or your kabungi roots or your water ribbons um, in these little <coughs> ovens. And so and just by camping in the same spot over and over, they build up the, the, the level of the, the ground. Some of the earth ovens um, north of here are about five metres above the level of the surrounding plains and the size of a twig field. So that's a, that's, a, that's a result of a lot of parties, um, all that <laughs> dash and you know, animal bones and, and shells and things, and all these, these clay balls. And so there's, there's, these sites are absolutely everywhere in these wetlands as well. And why were they camping there? Well, um, this is the productivity of these wetlands. Um, we did some bird counts. Uh, we had a flood in 2016. Those flood waters are still receding, kind of still, still drying out from, from the wetlands. Um, but in March, we, we counted 48,000 birds just in the two wetlands um, that were still holding water. So there's incredible diversity, about 74 species of, of birds, um, including 12 threatened species. So a really important site. This is why it's a Ramsar wetland. Heaps of, heaps of diversity, heaps of threatened species. More than 1% of some of those species were at, at this site. And including things like migratory waves, so all these guys who, um, as the wetlands dry, get this really, really rich um, mudflats, and things like these uh, these migratory waders who fly 15,000 kilometres up to Siberia and Alaska to, to breed, then they have they don't like winter, so as soon as winter hits, you wouldn't like winter in Siberia. It's pretty cold, so you fly down to Australia during the summer holidays down here, and then fly back. So they're a bit sort of jet setter kind of lifestyle, uh, but they come down and they fatten them up, fatten themselves up on these rich food sources. We're going to fly back into uh, to the northern hemisphere, um, and then uh, that first picture I showed with all the birds. A lot of those were actually freckled duck. Freckled duck are an uh, endangered species in Victoria. Um, there's probably only about five to ten thousand uh, freckled duck in the world, and we had about fifteen hundred of them um, in the Grand Masters earlier this year. So, from an ecological point of view, it's really, really significant. And freckled duck are actually close, more closely related to a swan than a duck. And they eat a lot of aquatic vegetation, and that's what the, that's what vegetation is like when the when the marshes are flooded, without too many carp. So the, the last big flood we had, the floods went all the way down and joined up with these wetlands with a heap of carp, and the carp swam upstream and totally destroyed the vegetation. This this recent flood we had didn't didn't go as far as those wetlands, so the carp didn't invade. We had this fantastic growth of this aquatic vegetation, and that's what supports the the biomass of birds. Um, another culturally significant animal is the eastern long turtle. Um, this is a, a barabba kind of totem. And they breed, there's a little hatchling here. They, they like the blue nets on the eastern side. It's on sandy soil. They can get up above the flood lines and, and lay their nests in there. Now, the, the, the part of the Ramsar listing was the importance as a, as a bird breeding colony. Um, these are uh, cormorants, darters. Um, when the, when the trees were alive, they had obviously nice shady canopies, and this area here, semi-arid, gets about 35, 40 degrees pretty, pretty commonly in summer. So if you're a bird trying to breed, and you've got no live canopy shading the chicks, it makes it pretty hard. So, um, so one of our key things we wanted to do was try and restore some tree canopy. Um, and the other important uh, resource in terms of ecological resource was all that timber that, from the hollows. So heaps of our species are hollow dependent, and, um, and if we don't have trop hollow trees, we have, there's a whole bunch of animals that can't nest and breed. <coughs> and even though we've got lots of those at the moment, it's not a sustainable thing because a lot of those trees are falling over and rotting. And so we need to get some, some young trees happening to, to you know, create the hollows for the future. 
And, and all that dead timber, as I was saying, is also fantastic reptile habitat. So we've got about 16 species of reptile, including, again, a really culturally significant animal, the like Murray Island carpet python, um, but a whole bunch of other species which, which hide under fallen timber. And as the wetlands dry, um, so when the wetlands are full, they're full of all those, those aquatic plants I was showing before, that the freckled duck are feeding on. When they dry, a whole different sort of species grows, and, and a lot of these are, are culturally significant as well. So things like the Australian hollyhock here, you can use the, um, the, the bark on the outer part of the, this little shrub to make spring from. Um, you've got this endangered hoary scurf pea, and before the recession of the last flood, um, I'd only seen a handful of these plants. There's, there's a couple of hectares of that plant right there, so um, pretty significant area for that. And this is in an area that had gone salty. So, um, so the, the appearance of these plants showed us that the, the wetland was actually starting to recover. And, um, and yeah, a whole bunch of others, coffee significant plants. This is a, a green vegetable. That's your sort of salad you have with your, you know, your um, roasted swan's eggs or whatever. And this is a really important medicinal plant. Um, one of the guys working on our project, Jason, had to have a cyst cut out of his back halfway through the project. And um, he used the old man weed. The doctor said it would take him three months to go back to work. And he was back at work in three weeks because he made his uh, wash out of his plant. So um, a, a very significant cultural healing plant. So as I say, the masters were healing, were showing signs of healing themselves. So you can see the, the tree canopies dying there and starting to come back. So what, what happened was we had the millennium drought. The, city, the water level table dropped away. It made water really expensive so the irrigation farmers couldn't just splash water around. So they've actually gotten pretty good at um, not wasting water now. And so we've got this situation where we've got the canopy starting to recover. And so nature is showing us that it's ready to you know, try and get these wetlands back into, back into action. Um, but unfortunately, in a flood, all the red gum seed washes to the edge of the wetland, so we've got this fantastic regeneration, a ring of seedlings all the way around the wetland, but nothing coming out and thousands of hectares out in the middle. So our project was to try and get those trees happening back out in the middle of the wetland. So, we, so the idea was to engage the Brapa River, um, encourage the, the tree canopy to regenerate the, the deeper parts of the wetland, get that roosting habitat back for the birds, put the habitat back for the reptiles and woodland birds and a whole bunch of other values. So here we have, there's Uncle Duck out there um, planting in the heat and we're, we're planting on the recession of the flood water so the water's done the job of herbicide, we can do it totally organically, we can need to use any herbicide. We use these long stem um, bicos, so these are red gums here. We're punching the root balls about that far into the mud, so that, that means the tree's got access to moisture for a long period of time. And we did it in stages, so as this part of the wetland dried, we planted around there, and then, uh, and then we worked our way into the centre of the wetland. And there were actually some naturally treeless areas, which we, we obviously didn't plant. And we got this fantastic response from the trees. Um, we did a whole lot of soil testing before we did this, obviously, just to make sure we weren't going to, you know, be trying to solve and triple the trees again. Um, and our trees are just growing absolutely fantastic, we've got fantastic growth rates, in fact. Um, and when those, those trees grow, uh, we replanted out about 1,000 hectares, we about 11,000 plants, um, trees and uh, red gums and emong. And when all, they, when all those grow, there'll be restored habitat for these rare woodland birds, and we'll be sucking thousands of tonnes of carbon out of the atmosphere. Brackle are also working on other projects to restore um, underground, uh, sort of ground layer diversity and food plants like Nardu and, and water rivers. Um, so the project was coordinated by the North Central CMA, funded by the Australian Government. Um, CMA coordinated, happy to coordinate because it aligned with the, the river health strategies and things. Um, there's law against us, she's the one supposed to be um, giving the talk. But anyway, we, the, the project employs 16 traditional owners. We've got the local nurseries to grow the trees. And as I said, we've, we've planted 11,000 uh, new mum and red gum. And so the people were employed for over um, 1,500 hours of work. We've got five flat tyres, we've got three cars boiled, we've got one car stuck up on a stump, um, and we saw some really big ground snakes. Um, but this is the results we got. Uh, this is about six months after planting, that tree is almost as tall as Uncle Duck. Uncle Duck's not that tall, so it's still pretty good though. Um, and, um, and we were planting in the heat of summer because we were, we were following the water down, and we were sort of dictated by the, by the, by the heat of um, what, when the water was growing out. But so we just had to be careful with the heat stroke. Um, but the positive aspects from the rap rap point of view, obviously they got employment, but there was an opportunity for the older people, there's Jason the guy who was back with the old man weed, um, to pass on some of that knowledge to the younger crew, Budge and some of the other guys here. Um, but also just an opportunity for them to spend time together on country and observing plants and animals and cultural sites and passing on knowledge. Things to be improved, we could do them with a few more spare tires because we popped a few that did. Um, but the other thing was, yeah, the rap should have probably been involved more in the early stages of the project. So um, that's it. So thanks very much.